That's fine. All right, is everything in order? Okay. Well, once again, good afternoon, welcome back. And we have one more speaker in this session this afternoon, and it's Claire Reeler. And Claire is an archeologist completing a PhD on stone tools from Bahrain. She has a lifelong passion for archeology, span loves maps, and somehow always ended up mucking around on computers. So it was somewhat inevitable that she ended up using geographical I'm sorry, Geographic Information Systems, GIS, and databases for archaeological research. Claire uses a variety of open source tools in her work and research, including QGIS and HURIST, an archaeological information management system. She loves talking about archaeology and now takes talks to schools, making things a bit more interesting and hands-on with resources such as skulls of human ancestor fossils printed on a 3D printer from files shared under Creative Commons licenses. And today her talk is called Sculling Around, Hands-On History. So let's welcome Claire. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And yep, that pretty much summed up who I am and what I'm gonna be talking about today. So let's talk about the, let me find out how to drive it. Let's talk about open data in archaeology. Now, Maya said in her talk this morning that somebody said to her, there's no such thing as open science. All science is open by definition. You can only have closed science, which is not open. And in archaeology, it's been regarded by many people as much the same. So the concept that if you have real science, you have data that can be checked that people can use to try and replicate the results that you got from your research, has led archeologists to put forward the open sharing of data for several decades. Um, one of the earliest collaborations in order to do this was the Archaeology Archeo Data Service, which I'll talk about in a moment, but other people have picked up on that. The Smithsonian, particularly with their Human Origins Program, has been very good at providing resources and data for people. Um, Kenyan National Museum seems to be making a point of providing all of its fossil material and artifacts um, as STL files for people who want to do 3D prints. And there are various universities and research organizations around the world that do have open sharing of data. And then, of course, you can even find archaeological stuff on Thingiverse every now and then. Somebody somewhere will scan something and just chuck it up on the web. So it's worth looking around. The Archaeology Data Service um, it was founded by UK academics. It was talked about in the late 80s and it actually started in the 90s. And its primary goal was twofold. Both there was a growing realization that having a lot of large disks with people's data on, or even worse, notebooks, um, various kinds of the first portable hard drives were coming in and it was like how do we have all this data that people can actually access and that if we want to look at it in 30 or 40 years time when the researcher who's been keeping it at the bottom of his desk all along has finally passed on to other things um, how do we actually get to that data because can we even read it 10 years later so keeping it accessible was one of their main goals and then having it available for other people to research in the true um, philosophy of science. Um, so that was their two twofold approach. They have ended up devising a code of good practice for digital data in archeology span and their um, site has both literature and project data available for people to download. So they really practice what they preach and put it out there for everyone to use. The Smithsonian has a slightly different take on it. Their um, angle is public outreach. One of the big things they do is promote themselves um, and try to get people into the Smithsonian. But in doing that, they provide a lot of educational material, a lot of resources, and they are, for what they are, fairly open. Um, particularly, they do have STL files of skulls and artifacts that you can use. 
For me, the big surprise was the Kenyan National Museum, who's joined together with National Geographic, the Turkana Basin Institute, which is headed by Richard Leakey, son of Louis Leakey, if those names mean anything to anybody, um, and several other partners who have also made a commitment to get all their stuff available online for anybody who might want to access it. Um, and again, it's the fossils and the artifacts that are available. Right, so I don't know how many of you remember your history days at school, but history in particular in schools has a reputation for being that sort of subject. And I find it a real shame because history and archaeology is my passion. I get so excited about it. And the fact that people can just stand there and drone on and make it so boring you want to cry is such a loss to the world. I had a Latin teacher at school who was just awesome, and she used to draw the battles on our blackboard, and she would draw the landscape and put in the mountains and forests and rivers and anything that was relevant, and then she'd have the different um, Roman and Persian, or whoever they were, forces, Greeks and Persians, Romans with each other, Romans and Sp uh, Greeks and Spartans, the different forces approaching from different angles and crossing different harbours and rivers and, and fight it all out on the blackboard for us. And that really, really stuck. And many years later, when I was travelling in those areas, I could actually see those battles replayed in my head. So that, to me, is inspirational teaching. Um, I think a lot of teachers find it very difficult because of the restriction of resources. So history is usually presented purely as text, often with a few images thrown in. Um, now, we know from studies of, of how people learn that that only addresses a couple of the learning styles. We all have different strengths in the way that we learn in different areas. And particularly with younger children, their strengths are in the areas of actually doing stuff with their hands and very visual. And so we're bombarding them with text at an age that they want to be doing things with their hands, and it's just not a good match. So even where people put in pictures, you're still at a great remove from your material, and it's that bit harder to actually engage. For example, if we're talking about human ancestors and um, evolution over time and looking at different skulls and our relationship to other an animals and organisms on this planet, we might compare a modern gorilla with a modern human skull and then look at human ancestors and talk about morphological changes in the skull over time. When you're looking at it in black and white, as is shown on this slide, um, it is a bit dry. Particularly when you get into the higher years at school and you start to toss the anatomy at them and we're talking about um, zygomatic arches and canine fossa and sagittal crest and you're giving them a picture like this to actually integrate that into a knowledge base that you have is quite a challenge. Granted, these days we can take that step forward. There's been so much more work done that we can make it a little bit more interesting at the pictorial level. So if we're looking here at a fossil ancestor seven, about seven million years old from Africa, you can see down the bottom of the slide a picture of a skull with pins, which is how people use um, known depths of muscle to reconstruct these faces. So to the right of the skull with the pins is a half reconstructed face, and then that leads to the actual reconstructions that we can see in these diagrams that actually start to bring these fossils to life for us so we can actually see what they would have looked like. A lot of it is interpretation. We don't know how hairy they were, what skin color, all that sort of thing. So we're still in the land of interpretation. As you can see, the interpretations can vary quite dramatically themselves, but it's starting to get a bit more interesting. Now, if we were to talk about the different features of the skull, if I just go back to that previous slide for a moment, if you're looking at that and how to absorb knowledge, and you compare that to a 3D printed human skull, you can immediately see the difference between trying to engage with that um, basic image and trying to, you know, actually having something that you can turn upside down, you can look at all the features, you can have it poke around, you can feel it in your hand. So I'm going to pass these around. That's the modern human skull. 
And you can have a look at for yourself, comparing the features on our skulls with the ancestors as we go back in time. So moving on to Sahel Anthropus. Um, this is a 3D print of the Sahel Anthropus skull. As I said, about 7 million years. Just the things to note in particular on this skull, skull, it has been reconstructed from fragments. And when reconstructed, it has this shape. Doesn't mean that Sahel Anthropus had this kind of wonky head. What would have happened is the skull lay in, in um, sediments and got compressed over time. And it would have obviously been compressed in this angle before it finally shattered. So hence, when it's reconstructed, it's reconstructed to the compressed stage. We can't take it back further than that. Okay, yep, just to mention, these are all printed at half size. So that's half dimension every direction, which is why they seem so small. So what we're doing in the class is we're actually starting to give this information, use the pretty pictures, and then give the kids something that they can actually hold and look at. So from Sahel Anthropus, we can move down to Australopithecus africanus, again from Africa. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the famous Taung child fossil, which was found by Raymond Dart in southern Africa in 1925. At the time, it was very controversial because people were still debating whether or not humans came from apes. And I must just add that this is a pet peeve of mine because saying that humans came from apes is the same as saying that you are descended from your cousin. Obviously, you are not descended from your cousin. You're both living in the present. We have common ancestors, and Sahel Anthropus, which is going around at the moment, is the one common ancestor that we know is linked to both us and chimps at 7 million years. So it's a little less controversial than now, but the interesting thing about the town child fossil is that it was in limestone deposits, and the water trickling through the limestone actually replaced some of the soft tissue as well. And so it's the first endocast of a brain in this section over here. And once again, you can actually feel it. You can actually feel the shape of that child's brain um, and see even the teeth. And so just that extra level of detail. This is um, an adult fossil by comparison. If you Compare those with the modern human skull, you can start to see the size differences because, again, if we say 400 to 500 cubic centimetres cranial capacity, it's the, uh, quite that same feeling of the difference in size. Um, this is an adult female, so if you like, the mother of the town child. And the most famous Australopithecus africanus, well, she's now called Afarensis, but um, is Lucy who's the specimen that was found by Don Johansson in the 70s. They claim that Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was playing on the radio at the time, and that's why they called her Lucy. I have other theories, knowing Don Johansson and his somewhat interesting reputation. Um, another one that the kids find very interesting is Paranthropus boisei. This, <laughs> yeah, he's also known as Nutcracker Man, because he had a very strong jaw. Um, he has what's called a sagittal crest, which is this ridge of bone across the top of the skull, and that was actually the attachment for the jaw muscles. So it went all the way up onto the top of the skull. So this chap could literally crack nuts with his teeth. Um, it's my theory that since they named him after their sponsor, and as you can see, the reconstructions of him are not that flattering, um, they perhaps had a very interesting relationship with their sponsor. Um, but the main thing about Boise Eye is that he is a side cousin. A line, um, at that time there were several hominids in the landscape. Um, the last members of Australopithecus africanus and afarensis, uh, the first individuals of Homo habilis, which is in our direct line, this one here, um, and Zinjanthropus or Australopithecus boisei. They're all running around the same landscape together. The only one that continued was the Homo line. So that is worth thinking about. Um, we don't know exactly what led to these different species being outcompeted, but outcompeted they were. And then, personal favourite, uh, Homo erectus. We've got two 
examples of the same fossil. I mean, just to elaborate, these are actual fossils that have been scanned. So these um, are, are not just reconstructions of atypical, but are scans of actual fossils. These ones are both a um, female, probably Homo ergaster. There's some discussion in the scientific community as to whether Homo ergaster can be called a separate species or not. They're basically the same as Homo erectus. They're out, um, yeah. It, in the specimens that are going around, notice you can even feel the individual teeth if you run your fingers along the jaw. They're our most successful ancestor. They were running around for at least a million years, so that's a lot longer than we have. Anatomically, modern humans have got about 100,000 years at the moment, so this is 10 times more. Um, yeah, and you can see the comparisons with modern humans. You start to see a face that looks really recognizable. We always joke that um, you could populate a very good rugby team out of these chaps. Um, they have the right sort of build. They did have certain characteristics that are on the line to modern human behavior. We know from the fossils, from the level of um, injury to some of the fossils, which they sustained and lived for many years with before they died, that people in, in the group must have actually looked after old and weak individuals. There's one particular individual um, from a cave in Israel called Shanadar. This chap was either the unluckiest lad alive or an ultimate klutz because he had been in a rock fall that had fractured his skull and impacted on one of his eyes so that he was blind in that eye. Possibly in the same event, he'd had something go wrong with his arm and they'd actually amputated his arm at the elbow and what was left of the arm had withered away. Uh, he had a badly broken leg which set so badly that he would have been able to walk but only just. So he had these numerous things wrong with him and lived to a comparative ripe old age. So people were really looking after their friends. Okay, and now we go on to the Neanderthals. So Neanderthals are always a fun one. I don't have an actual skull of a Neanderthal printed yet. We do have the STL file for it, but we haven't had a chance to print it. Because this is the typical reconstruction that you used to see. Um, somebody who was hunched, stooped over, kind of, not really somebody you'd want to acknowledge as a direct ancestor. This is because one of the earliest fossils of Neanderthal that was found was an elderly arthritic individual who was stooped and hunched over <laughs> and all this. Didn't mean that everybody walked like that. So what we can emphasize for the kids is this is what Neanderthals are more likely to have looked like. And there I've got some pictures. That this is the STL file of the Neanderthals skull that we've got that we will be printing for the kids. And then we can talk about the features. Neanderthals are controversial because what were they? Were they an ancestral species? Were they a side branch? Um, how do they fit in with anatomically modern humans? We know that they were around during the last ice age, and we know that most of them are not still around. There are some stories of um, people being spotted with typical Neanderthal features. There's a story of an um, archaeology conference in Eastern Europe where in the same building there was a conference of econ economists and the archaeologists spotted somebody with classic Neanderthal features amongst the economists and spent the rest of the conference trying to sneak around and take photos of this chap without him noticing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the basic position that's most widely held at the moment is that there was intermixing. I mean, um, yeah, the fact that human beings, that anatomically modern humans did not become a separate species despite being scattered over the entire planet for 60,000 years tells you how good we are at mixing our genetic material. So, um, yeah, there, there is definite evidence that's widely accepted that Neanderthals were interbred, but it's still a fact that we don't have a large population of Neanderthals still living. And what it seems to be is that they were adapted for extreme cold. So as you can see in the 
uh, lower right of the slide where you're looking at that fossil skull straight on, you've got that huge nasal cavity. They had a very large nose, and the advantage of that in an ice age is it means when you breathe the air in, you can warm it up in your nose before you stick it in your lungs. And it means you're less likely to develop pneumonia when it's really cold. Um, they had short, stocky bodies, um, relatively tough. So again, you don't lose as much heat. If you're tall and, and lanky, like some of the people in Central Africa, you're very good at dissipating heat. If you're short and stocky, you tend to preserve it. Um, they actually had a larger brain size than modern humans. So again, that's an interesting one. It shows you can't correlate brain size exactly with uh, evolutionary success. Right, so it's not just about skulls. What we do and what we're passionate about taking into the classrooms is that experience, that chance for kids to really get hands-on and do stuff instead of just being there receiving it. I mean, it's Thomas Hardy who talked about children in classrooms as empty vessels into which you poured knowledge, and we all know that that's not really an optimal way to learn. So as well as being able to add that extra dimension, we can actually set the kids' tasks to actually do the sorts of things that adult researchers will do. And this is why I put at the bottom on the slide, millennia of education, because that's how kids have always learnt. Going back through human history and prehistory, they learnt right alongside the adults, doing the same sorts of things as the adults, sometimes with scaled down versions of what the adults were doing, but they were right in there doing real stuff. So that's what we do. We give the kids the skulls, we give them um, examples of fossils to look at, we give them calipers, um, we give them different ways of measuring things, and we say, okay, write down all the differences that you can see between this skull and this skull. What are the similarities? What's changing between this one and that one? What are the differences in size? What are the characteristics of these different types of fossils? Um, we can even do it with artifacts. Um, this is just a little sphinx of Hatshepsut, who was the first woman to actually use the uh, title pharaoh and to use the pharaonic wig and moustache um, characteristics in her presentations. We can set up mock excavations in sand pits so that the kids can actually do pretend excavations, reveal these artifacts and actually start studying them, which is stuff that they're only now doing at uni. Um, and I'm nearly finished, I'll take questions in a moment. And what's more is with all these resources being available on Creative Commons, we can actually give them to the schools and then the schools can print them themselves. They can actually create their own resource bank. So instead of spending $200 per skull to buy in a model from the US, they can just download the file and print it on the 3D printer that most schools have. People can take it home and do the same thing. Um, they can look at all sorts of other stuff. They can hunt stuff online, look at things that might be too fragile or too far away that they wouldn't be able to access in other ways. And it's targeting those areas of learning that are strengths, particularly in younger um, age groups, that kinesthetic learning and visual learning. And so this has become a passion of ours to take it into the schools and actually get away from kids asleep at their desks and, and make it more interesting for everybody. Right, um, so questions. You had your hand up before? I'd love to. Potentially, yes. The problem is that you run into a quagmire of bureaucracy very fast. To actually do that, you need all sorts of permits, and to get the permits, you then got to run through health and safety, hoops and jumps. It's probably doable, but it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whether uh, they could do actual digs, excavations in school grounds or something. Oh. I mean, in my day when I studied archaeology, we were taken out as students and we worked on real digs from beginning of first year. That was how you trained. Now they don't go on a real dig until postgraduate. I mean, I think it's appalling. We had to have 30 days minimum of field work before we could graduate, and now they're not allowed to do any field work until after they graduate. It's just... Hail the nanny state. All right. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go through the credits while we're doing questions because we need to acknowledge the appropriate. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you for a great talk. It's really interesting and I can see how the skulls just bring it all to life. How have you found um, it, it's, this is received by schools? Like, you know, are they open to it? Are they excited? Are they reluctant? Or how is, how's it... When the rubber hits the road, what kind of happens? Okay. Well, um, either I've been really fortunate or um, people do seem to be genuinely interested. I mean, in a way, I half fell into this because as soon as the teachers hear I'm an archaeologist, they go, oh, won't you come and <laughs> talk to the school? So um, that started at primary school that my daughters were attending, and because they're doing Montessori, they do um, the great stories, and they actually start with the formation of the universe and then work their way through all the different time periods. So we could jump in there straight away with the skulls and start talking about human ancestors and everything, that went really well. Um, and then I discovered that when my daughter went into high school, they actually do archaeology in year seven um, history in Queensland now, which is just awesome for me. So again, I contacted the school and said, oh, I'm an archaeologist. And they went, oh, fantastic, come in and talk to the kids. Um, and then they said, oh, and by the way, our year 11s are doing a special on um, skulls and human ancestors. And I went, oh, I've got these 3D models. So <laughs> yeah, so they've been really, really excited. And the kids love it because... Yeah, they're doing ancient history and their friends are looking at them going, really? And they're like, well, today we were playing with 3D models, of, you know, printed on the 3D printer and their friends are like, oh, wow. Yeah, so it makes it really funky and cool um, as well as more interesting for them. And a lot of them were asking like, oh, you know, what, what do you have to do to become an archaeologist? And, and one of the girls said, oh, she actually decided she was just doing ancient history as something to fill in and she was going to go into something different at uni, but she decided it was so fascinating she was going to carry on in uni and work with it some more. So, yeah, uh, it's been really well received. So, I'm still waiting for the day that um, we have people object about the content, but... Yeah. I've been put to in contact with these schools with all kinds of things. Creationists will be okay, they'll just argue that they're only two hundred years old. Oh right. Yeah. So, so the question is, are there applications using the 3D printing beyond yep. the fossils that we've seen? Yep, um, definitely. Um, in particular, I'm interested in setting up these mock excavations. I mean, most schools have got a high jump pit, I mean, a long jump pit, and that's all you need is some sand that you can dig in, and then you can actually set stuff at different levels. And because you can 3D print everything from the stone artifacts, from the earliest, I mean, human ancestors started banging rocks together and getting a sharp edge that they could do something with a about one and a half million years ago, 1.8 million years ago. Um, and those early tools are called older one tools because they were first described in Olduvai Gorge in East Africa. Um, those are available on the Kenya National Museum website that you can print. So we could do an entire sequence from one and a half million years ago at the bottom right through. Um, there's files of, I haven't been able to find any for this talk, but there are files of Egyptian mummies. Um, there's, as I said, that hat chip, so there's different time periods, there's Roman stuff. So you can build it right through and then up to the very recent stuff and, and actually, you know, have, all them, have them go through all the different levels and talk about all those different time periods in history. And then, again, it's stuff that they can pass around without... Um, just visiting a museum and staring in through the glass case and not being able to touch it. Um, I mean, museums are getting better with that as well. Um, and the Smithsonian and other websites have a large interactive stuff that you can actually run little apps and, and zoom in on things and manipulate them in 3D space and whatever. So that is, it's a step, but it's still not, a screen is not an object in your hand. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of potential really.
I haven't. Um, it's again. Oh, okay. Yes, the question is, uh, how about Australian uh, archaeological materials? Yeah. Um, again, it's a whole fascinating realm that one could do so much with. I mean, I think one's own local archaeology is something that a lot of people would love to be able to connect with. Um, it is politically interesting because you would have to speak to the group who has connection to the land and get their feeling about it. I mean, I've never had a problem with any Aboriginal groups that I've encountered with talking to kids about their stuff. I don't have any right to speak about anybody's country because I don't have any of those affiliations. But um, just in terms of, of providing information about the sorts of... Um, stuff that was going on in Australia's past. I've never had anybody have, have an issue with that, but it would be something, it would be best to be able to get some Aboriginal groups on board with wanting to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of options. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. All right, good. Well, thank you very, very much. Have uh, present. <laughs>